this is why capital allocators, the superior capital allocators, uh, tend to generate excellent long-term returns. They're hiring. They're hiring at a point in time in which their competitors are static or letting people go or are retrenching. These are the times in which the winners are made in the market. It's not times in which capital is as cheap as can be. It's the times in which chat capital is dear. I'm Chris Hill, and that was Motley Fool Senior Analyst Bill Mann. How good a company is at handling its cash says a lot. Do they pay a dividend, buy back stock, make an acquisition, or maybe just hold on to the money? These are decisions that long-term investors pay close attention to. Today, Bill joins fellow analysts Ari Hughes and John Rotanti to talk about six companies handling capital allocation in ways we like to see. Hi, Fools. I'm John Rotanti. I'm joined by Ari Hughes and Bill Mann. We are talking capital allocation, and we're going to share with you some of the companies that we think excel at capital allocation. Before I ask Ari for his first pick, I just want to quickly go through what we mean by capital allocation. And so, a business generates sales, and then it chooses how to allocate the gross profits, really, that it generates from those sales. And some of the allocation can be into long-term growth investments, into things like research and development, even some sales and marketing may be considered long-term investment, and then capital uh, investment, you know, property, plant, and equipment, capital expenditures. Those are all long-term growth investments that can be considered capital allocation. When a, when, a, when a company runs out of high return on capital investments that it can make, either through, like we just said, re- research and development, capital expenditures, et cetera, then it has to decide what to do with, it, with its excess free cash flow. And then in that case, it can either pay down some debt, make an acquisition, buy back stock, or pay a dividend. Really a rule that I try to, you know, live by when I'm, when I'm analyzing corporate management teams, Bill and Ari, is if a company has high return on invested capital investment opportunities, then it should invest every single penny that it can into those high return investments, into those high return uh, opportunities. It's a, it's a crime if a company is paying a dividend when it has high return on invested capital opportunities that it could be investing in. But on the other hand, If a company doesn't have any high return on invested capital opportunities, then it's a crime not to return capital to shareholders, either through dividends or intelligent share repurchases. So, with that framework in mind, Ari, what is an example of a company uh, and its management team that you think excel at capital allocation? I'm going to go Constellation Software. This is uh, just a company I love and I continue to get to know and learn. And I think it's it's a wonderful company to study for your business education in general, because I think um, they've mastered uh, M&A, uh, the uh, essentially mergers and acquisitions. Uh, so essentially it was started by uh, a gentleman named Mark Leonard in 95 and he was a venture capitalist 11 years and he acquired small software plays. Um, and then he continuously did this for long periods of time. And the business has just grown tremendously um, over years. It's compounded something like I think in the high 20s or 30% for over 10 years. And he's done this with the M&A strategy. And I think this is profound because a lot of companies essentially destroy value with M&A and they're not great capital allocators or they overpay or they promise synergies and things that don't materialize. And we see that um, later. But he has this wonderful strategy. And um, one of the things I think is unique is the in Cap IQ, the share count um, when they went public was 21 million shares. And today it is still 21 million shares. And they've 
earned a return on equity of in the high 30s for a consistently long period of time. Um, and I think this is one of the best companies in the world a lot of people don't know about. And they're very disciplined and they have this process as well. And I think the other unique thing to mention is as you get larger, you have to do more acquisitions to generate the same amount of earnings and return on equity because uh, because your capital base is growing. So they've consistently been able to do this for a long period of time. So I think um, Mark Leonard is just a, um, a master at capital allocation. Bill, this is one you know pretty well. I know it pretty well, and it, and Ari is exactly right. And if you ever get a chance to go to the Constellation Software front page of their of, of their website, they are first and foremost interested in getting introductions to vertical management software companies that are interested in selling. This company is built for capital allocation, because if you think about it, there's no such thing as hey, let's go upload the Constellation software uh, suite. It doesn't exist. They are a series of small companies, and they use the returns from those companies as force multipliers uh, for other companies that they are interested in buying. And they do them by the dozens each year at this point. Yes, Constellation has excelled at making these acquisitions. They do you know, 100 of them a year. They, they literally do hundreds of these small acquisitions a year. But we don't want people to think that any company making acquisitions is going to be the next constellation. There is research showing that two-thirds of corporate M&A, two-thirds of corporate mergers and acquisitions, either destroy value or create no value. It's just, it just so happens that Mark Leonard and team at Constellation are exceptional. They are one of the exceptions. Berkshire Hathaway is an exception to this rule. Accenture is an exception to this rule. Accenture makes 40 or 50 acquisitions a year as well. And they also, like Ari said, maintain extremely high returns on equity and returns on capital. And when you see a company making lots of acquisitions a year, when you see a company where acquisitions are a part of their growth strategy, are a part of their capital allocation strategy, and they're not diluting their returns on equity and their returns on invested capital, you know you may have found a winning company. But those are rare. We can go even more cynical than that. The, in two-thirds of the cases, the only constituency that has a positive correlation with mergers and acquisitions is the compensation of the management team. That's exactly. They have right. a larger company upon which to be compensated. That, that's 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 cynical. <laughs> it also happens to be true because sometimes totally the compensation is just based on on growing the size of the business as measured by sales yeah. or EBITDA. Yeah. You, look how big we are now. Yeah. Look how much EBITDA <laughs> we have now. You know, even though it's even though it's 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 diluting returns on invested capital. Absolutely. Um, so Ari, such a a great one to start with. Bill, what you got for us? All right, John. We're going to start with a game, and it's completely unfair. This company has grown since the year 2000, on average, 5% per year. Okay. What has its share price done in the same period of time? I mean, I'm guessing much better than 5%. That's, that's such a weasel answer. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a weasel answer and probably an understatement. <laughs> Yeah. Ari, what do you think? 5% per year uh, for 22 years. Let's go uh, 13% per year. for. Not bad. It's 20. 8x oh, what okay. it was. 8x. 5% per year growth on the top line. 8x return for shareholders. The company, it's an exciting one. It's WD-40. And WD forty, you can you you know its core brand. It also makes. Try to withhold your excitement. They make toilet bowl cleaners under the X fourteen brand. They also make lava soap. The way to think of this company, the reason that a company can can grow at their shares by ADEX growing only 5% per year is by virtue of how careful and how cautious they are with the capital that comes in. When they reinvest that capital, they do an absolutely wonderful job. This is a company that maintains, as a, as a branded cleaning company, operating margins of nearly 20%, and they have had this for decades. That's just incredible that a company that is that you know, 
Yeah, we'd put it in the slow growth category. Um, yeah. can, can 8x its stock price through superior allocation. And, you know, I've heard of some, I've heard of, you know, you can use WD-40 on just about anything. I've heard yeah. of some weird... Breakfast cereal? Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not cereal. But I've heard of some weird uses of WD-40. It's yeah, not and just they, for squeaky and, wheels and you know squeaky remote control gates and stuff like that. Yeah, they were one hundred percent supportive of all of these of of all of these weird uses. But WD forty, if you think about it, you would never think of this as being a growth a growth company or a high growth company. You don't necessarily need a high growth company to generate spectacular returns on the stock if you have a company that has a management team that is very very careful for how it reinvests its capital. And Gary Ridge and his team. Team at WD40 are absolutely that. I mean, I just googled it really quickly. Remove chewing gum from hair. <laughs> WD40. Stop wasp nests. WD40. Clear up crayons. WD40. Remove dog mess. Loosen a stuck ring. Piano keys. I mean, it's not, you know, waterproof your shoes. Here we go. So WD-40 is... As fish bait. Yeah, fish bait. <laughs> Pike. Pike are attracted to WD-40. Wow, wow. Uh, so mine is going gonna, is gonna to be no surprise. Uh, it is one of my favorite companies, and it's Texas Instruments. Mm -hmm. And so Texas Instruments... They allocate capital in, in, in several ways. One is they are entering a massive CapEx investment cycle uh, in order to drive 7% annualized revenue growth over the next 15 years. That's their goal. And so, to give you an idea of what I mean by massive, in the five years from 2016 through 2020, Texas Instruments spent about $771 million per year in CapEx. $771 million. Then in 2021, their CapEx jumped to $2.5 billion. And from 2022 through 2025, they are guiding for CapEx of $3.5 billion per year. After 2025, going forward, so starting in 2026, they're saying their CapEx will average 10% of sales per year. Their historical CapEx, back when I said it was $771 million per year, historically their CapEx was about 5 to 6% of sales. So over the long term, they're doubling their CapEx to sales ratio because there is so much increased demand for semiconductors in the digital world. Uh, so they invest in CapEx. They also spend about $1.5 billion per year on research and development. So they spend about 11% of their sales on research and development. So investing heavily into growth, but um, they also are committed. So, so these growth investments, fools, these growth investments are before you get free cash flow, right? So you invest in R&D, you invest in CapEx, you invest in some other things, and what's left over is free cash flow. So they make these growth investments, but they are committed to returning 100% of their free cash flow to investors through dividends and buybacks. And their formula is to pay out 40% to 80% of their annual free cash flow as a growing dividend, and then use the remainder to buy back stock when they think it's trading at a discount to intrinsic value. As far as the dividend, it currently yields 2.8%. And they've increased that dividend for 18 consecutive years. Since 2004, Texas Instruments, its dividend per share has compounded at a 25% CAGR, or compounded annual growth rate. And more recently, it, over the last five years and the last 10 years, its dividend per share has compounded at over 20% per year. So this is a massive dividend growth company compounding that dividend over 20% per year. The dividend yield is 2.8%. And then if you like buybacks, by the way, they've reduced their shares outstanding by 46% since 2004. 
And it's still a high margin company. This is what's incredible to me about Texas Instruments the fact that they have made so many capital decisions that essentially both return capital to shareholders and self liquidate in terms of reducing the share count. And yet, what they're using that capital for are things that don't necessarily add to the operations of the company but at the same time the money that they are putting to the to the operations of the company uh, is also returning at a very very high rate it's an incredibly high margin business why wouldn't you so john why wouldn't you want to see them reinvest more capital into the business rather than rather than share buybacks you know like i said they've committed to going in capex from 770 million a year to 3.5 billion that's that's a pretty big commitment they yeah they're not one, starving the business yeah they spend 1.5 billion per year on r&d but bill you're right i just think that rich templeton the ceo he fundamentally believes in returning capital to shareholders um, above and beyond what they need to grow the business and so they are investing i mean they're entering a massive investment cycle but yeah, I mean, you're right. Maybe there's an argument to be made to invest above and beyond what they are doing now, take on more debt to do so. It, it's, a, it's a possibility because, the, like you said, the margins and the returns on that investment are so remarkably high. Rich Templeton, you know, he has this, this great idea that, and it's, it's, it's the right way to look at it buybacks are a way to reward continuing shareholders, right? I mean, if you're selling out, you don't get rewarded. Hmm. If the company's buying bu- buying stock from you, adios amigo, you're not getting rewarded. But if you're a continuing shareholder, then buying back stock at discounts to intrinsic value is one of the best things a company can do. It's one of the highest return on invested capital moves a company can make. And so, yeah, I mean, if you like dividend growth, if you like a, you know nearly 3% yield and you like buyback, uh, buybacks, take a look at at Texas Instruments. Ari, over to you. Round number two. Okay, so this is in the organic growth. Just there's business out there. We're going after it. We're going to get bigger, um, essentially. So, so most of the decision is going to be uh, the investments are going to be internal to the company. And I think um, I recently researched Adyen. Uh, they had a capital markets day. And um, wow, this this company is executing on all cylinders, and um, it's getting better. And the stock has been hammered. And um, I, I think people that hold on are going to be greatly rewarded. But essentially, what they have going on is um, their payments business. So this unified commerce. So essentially, if you do business in multiple geographies, and you have an uh, e-commerce platform, and you have POS, their system has been built so that you can um, use the both of those items. And it's easy to scale and kind of grow with your business. And you don't have to have multiple providers, like one for e-commerce and one for in-store point of sales purchases okay now they're also innovating their products so they're they're coming up with new solutions to better serve their customers and i think this is where we think about r d uh new new products right so some of the new things they're coming up with and i think this is brilliant is um adian capital so they have all this information about uh, these these people that do business on their platform, they they have insights into their financials. So let's say you're a coffee shop and you need a loan for a new espresso machine. Adyen has insights on all your data when cash comes into your business, when you make payments. So now they're going to start getting into the lending business, um, and they have the information to probably do that competitively. So that's like a new innovative thing um, where they're going to put the cash on their balance sheet to work. Um, so so ideally it doesn't just sit there, but even though they have uh, net cash, and then they're going to get into card issuing. So. If you're a business and for some reason you want to issue debit cards, or um, which I think uh, Marquetta is in that business, and that's a growing business as well. Um, so this, I, I like that. That's a good, I think, example of organic growth where there's just more business out there, and we're going to hire FTEs, engineers to mm-hmm. to come up with these innovative products. So that's uh, my kind of organic growth capital allocation example. I love that Ari's bringing in organic growth 
and a and an and an acquisitive growth. I mean, he's yeah, spreading just, he's just spreading two the on the opposite spectrum. <laughs> I love it though. You're you're spreading the yeah. love. And like I said, you know, far too many investors think of capital allocation. All they think of the, is the return of capital, and not and not the and not the growth investment part of it. Here's why this matters, and Agen has long been one of my favorite companies. I was delighted to see that Ari brought it to the table, and also not delighted because I would have brought it myself, or, <laughs> you know, had had he not done so. What we're seeing right now, particularly in tech and particularly in in in, in payment technology, is a real consolidation, you know, a retrenchment. One of the most interesting things. This is why capital allocators, the superior capital allocators. Uh, tend to generate excellent long-term returns. They're hiring. They're hiring at a point in time in which their competitors are static or letting people go or are retrenching. These are the times in which the winners are made in the market. It's not times in which capital is as cheap as can be. It's the times in which capital is dear. And so, the fact that Agen is out buying you know, buying growth, continuing to innovate, continuing to hire for R and D to me is a really outstanding signpost for what this company can be. I just pulled up Morningstar really quickly to look at their returns on invested capital. Ari, I mean, these are they're generating twenty nine percent returns on invested capital on that organic growth. In fact, I mean that's that's exceptional. That's exceptional for a company growing fifty percent a year. Are you kidding me? Like I. Honestly, I could maybe think. I could, no, I don't. I don't think I could, I don't think I can think of another company, <laughs> maybe one or two, that are growing forty to fifty percent, generating near nearly thirty percent returns on invested capital. I don't know if I can think of another company growing that fast, generating returns that high. I mean, maybe maybe a few, but that's it. It would be hard for me to do. You know, like SMB Global. And Mastercard and Visa, they have yeah. they have comparable returns on capital and and operating margins that are that are even higher, but they're not growing fifty percent. So it's like really, it's going to be hard to think of, think of a business with Adian's economics. Such a such a such a great one. Bill, do you want to go? Well, I talked about degreasers and things of that nature earlier. We're now going to talk about a company that's growing a little bit faster. Nine percent over the last twenty years, but it's just as boring. It's Church and Dwight from Princeton, New Jersey. They make Arm and Hammer baking soda and all of the different products that you see Arm and Hammer's label on, including kitty litter, detergents, road cleaners, OxyClean. They make Trojan condoms. They make first response brand home pregnancy kits. One of the ways that I think about capital allocators is a pretty simple way to do it is to measure their goodwill, which is basically the amount of money that they have paid on top of asset value for for, for, for companies they've acquired as a function of their assets and measure it against their operating margins. The higher the operating margins for 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 a company that has a fairly high level of goodwill should tell you that they have been allocating capital really, really well. And in the case of Church and Dwight, their operating margins are 19%, which is for a company that essentially makes branded commodities an incredibly high number. That's awesome. That that's incredible. How I mean, how is this company growing nine percent average per? That's a that's actually a pretty good growth rate for a, a you know a consumer products company like that. What they've done is they've gone out and they found bolt-on acquisitions okay. that uh, they were able to buy very cheaply. They they bought uh, Origel, for example, and the Water Pick brand is actually now owned by Arm and Hammer Baking Soda, by owned owned by Church and Dwight. So they've done so, which is why they have that goodwill number because that is you know that that when you see a company with a goodwill number, that means that they've gone out and have acquired other companies, and so they have done so by very smart acquisition of other brands. And then also by thinking of different ways that Arm and Hammer baking soda can be uh, added to uh, other products in a either a branded or a non-branded way. Awesome! Another bolt-on acquisition story. I love it. Um, so my last one is Home Depot. Another surprise, surprise. Um, 
And they, they have a very, very balanced capital allocation strategy. And so they invest, you know, two and a half billion dollars a year in CapEx, and that goes towards omni-channel retail. And so everything that need, you know, is involved in building out the computing power that they need for HomeDepot.com, which they completely revamped, its supply chain and logistics, whether it's fulfillment centers, um, whether it's delivery capabilities, they want to be able to deliver with everyone in the U.S. within two days or, or less. And so, you know, they're, they're investing a lot in omni-channel retail. And then, like Texas Instruments, they return excess cash to shareholders through a dividend and a buyback. So, first the dividend. They've paid a, they've paid a dividend every single year since 1990. And they've increased the dividend for 13 consecutive years. You may say, why only 13? It's because during the great financial crisis of 08, 09, uh, they just kept their dividend stable at 90 cents a year for one year. So during the housing crisis, rather than increase the dividend, they just kept it the same. But they've paid a dividend every single year since 1990. They have not cut the dividend. And they've increased that dividend every single year for the last 13 years. And over those 13 years, the dividend has compounded at a 17% growth rate. The current dividend yields 2.6%. So it's another you know, pretty substantial yield you're getting. And then for buybacks, in 2003, it had 2.3 billion shares outstanding. And these are fully diluted shares. In 2003, 2.3 billion shares. Now it has about a billion. So it has reduced its shares outstanding by over 50% at prices much, much lower than today's stock price. The average price at which they bought in 50% of their shares is much, much, much lower than today's stock price. And that's the ultimate test to see if they are getting a high return on those buybacks, is what, what price did they pay for the buybacks versus where the stock is trading today. And John, one of the most interesting things about Home Depot is that it actually is a test of both sides of good capital allocation and poor capital allocation. Because there was a stretch in its history from the period of about 2004 to 2007, in which it was being managed by a poor capital allocator. And it cost the company a lot of money to get him pushed out the door. And once uh, Frank Blake came in as the new CEO, the ship was steadied, and they began making really the same kind of decisions that they'd been making since Arthur Blank f founded the company uh, a couple decades prior to that. And Lowe's, by the way, their, you know, their largest competitor, another very, very, very high quality business, is in the midst of a turnaround the last, the last two years or so under their amazing CEO, Marvin Ellison. So, Bill Mann, Ari Hughes, always thank you for your time sharing your experience and your wisdom uh, with us. Fools. This was fun. Yeah. This was fun. Thank you. I'm John Rotanti on behalf of The Motley Fool. Thank you for listening. Fool on. As always, people on the program may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against, so don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear. I'm Chris Hill. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.